Not uncommon but almost rare is the case of African state or government initiating local funding initiatives to combat insecurity. Taxes and levies are a few of the many ways that this can be achieved, whether directly or indirectly. I'm Abdullah Hassan and this is In the Sahel, WADR's weekly magazine where we delve into the heart of the African security crisis, telling the stories and strategies to shape the region's response to pressing challenges. Last week's episode was on military hardware and counterpart financing. This week, experts take us through local funding initiatives. Lagos has a security trust fund. The security trust fund now is uh, uh, individuals, wealthy individuals at Lagos, where they make contributions to that trust fund where the state government now use to see how to fight insecurity. In commemorating this year's International Day of Victims of Acts of Violence Based on Religion or Belief, the United Nations Secretary General is urging commitment to creating a world where everyone can live free from fear, stigma and persecution. The Secretary General urged calling on governments to protect all people and places of worship, implement comprehensive and anti-discrimination laws and invest in education initiatives that foster inclusion and equal rights. This is In the Sahel, right here on West Africa Democracy Radio and broadcasting on 94.9 FM Dakar, Senegal and online on WADR.org. Local funding initiatives are platforms designed to raise funds to assist the security sector in its endeavor. In countries like Burkina Faso, the ruling military has such an initiative in place, collecting voluntary contributions from citizens and businesses as well as through taxation and levies. In early January 2023, the military government of Burkina Faso launched the Patriotic Support Fund, PSF, a state-run contributory platform to boost citizen engagement in restoring security nationwide. As of July this year, Ouagadougou said an estimated 99 billion CFA francs equivalent to $162.2 million has been generated by citizens to aid in the fight against terrorism. The government announcing the extension of the PSF for an additional year starting from January 1, 2024, stated that it has used most of the funds to back the Volunteers for the Defense of the Homeland, VDP. The funds have also been used to address their social expenses, supplying equipment and covering fuel costs. Augustine Coley tells us more. Extending this instrument allows Burkina Faso to continue financing its counter-terrorism efforts amid significant financial challenges further strained by the ongoing security and humanitarian crisis. Official data reveals a significant rise in the state budget's allocation to the defense and security sector, jumping from 20.27% in 2022 to 28.42% in 2023, with future projections indicating an increase to 29.49% in 2024. According to the World Bank, the expected decrease in the budget deficit to 6.1% of GDP by 2024, down from 6.7% in 2023, results from reallocating resources from security-related expenses to other vital areas while maintaining the battle against jihadist threats. The renewal of the Patriotic Support Fund, PSF, for another year aligns with stepped-up military operations aimed at fully reclaiming Bukinabi territory. The transition president, Captain Ibrahim Chouari, in October 2023, highlighted the crucial role of security, deeming it essential for the conduct of the highly anticipated national elections, whose date is unknown, after a national dialogue ended with the adoption of a resolution extending Chouari's rule by five years. However, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, reports that after a decline to 1.5% in 2022 from 6.9% in 2021, Burkina Faso's real GDP growth rebounded to 4.4% in 2023 with expectations for a rise to 6.4% in 2024. This is thanks to the PSF, the Burkina B Army and its auxiliary unit, 
the VDP continued to engage insurgents in areas out of state control in one of the deadliest Sahel operations. The country is home to nearly 2 million displaced persons from a seven-year fight that has killed hundreds of people, including civilians and security operatives. Augustine Coley with that report. More on local funding initiatives, I engaged Dr. Wole Ojole, a senior researcher with the Institute for Security Studies, ISS Dakar, Senegal, on the constitutionality of such and what questions come to mind as a citizen or as an observer. How much more should populations sacrifice and put up with in a bid to counter insecurity and do their contributions translate to the right for decision-making on security issues at the grassroots, state, regional, and national levels. Take a listen to Ojoale's response. Well, it has to be a case by case, and I was talking about first two. And this is not a prejudice, it is just speaking to the facts and the figures that we have before us. It's about one of the poorest countries in the world, even though richly endowed with a modest population and um, when you look at environmental endowment as well, uh, it should be a country that uh, should not struggle to be in the middle income country. But this is the regular experience of most African countries. So that the state or the people have to take the initiative um, to begin to solicit for voluntary contribution from the people after they've paid their tax and also expecting from the government to guarantee them security. I will be very careful to endorse that. And that is going to be based on what has been the outcome as well. Burkina Faso has emerged as epicenter of terrorism in the world, at least according to the global terrorism database of their 2024 publication. And even if we don't go along that trajectory, you could see other areas in which incidents of attacks have been on the increase in the recent time against civilians, against military installation. And even if they have raised 100 billion CFA, it goes to show that we can reasonably argue that the money is not producing the intended outcome. So the primary duty of government is the security of lives and property and the welfare of the people. So I see it as an extra burden, even though it is a voluntary contribution on the part of the people. And uh, even though it might have worked in other areas, but um, I'm skeptical in endorsing that it has worked in Burkina Faso. Rather, I would rather say it is government that should really be up and doing to ensure that the taxpayers' money is judiciously utilized for the welfare of the people and for the security of their their lives. Mm. So this initiative, going by the data on incident of attacks, terror attacks in the country, I don't think it has yielded the desired outcomes or um, uh, outcome of the people. So maybe they are not complaining, but do, do you think that a time will come when they will have to really take into account the fact that they've made uh, a huge contribution towards um, stabilizing the country by boosting um, the military strength and presence? Definitely, if somebody's putting money together for this kind of initiative, there is an expected outcome, which is public safety. And if they don't get that, it might be the initial setback for such initiative. And then in places where this has also been put into practice, maybe like a security trust fund, like in some places in Nigeria, um, it has to also be gazetted in such a way that um, uh, it is uh, it is not a forever living initiative. It is always time bound. Maybe it's going to be leg- depending on the policy or the legislative trust that undergird such initiatives. Sometimes they might want to run it for five years or for 10 years or for two, three years. It's usually a short-term gap because on the long run, it is the government that needs to provide for the safety and security of the people. And let me also say that you cannot peg the security funding on such that is not a long-term view, that is not um, a constitutional responsibility of the people. It is a, you, you can't base security funding on voluntary contribution in a nutshell, let me put it that way, because it has to be something that is constant. It, is, it has to be something that is based on 
fiscal framework that is for the country in terms of budgetary allocation, what should go into the military. In a nutshell, you can't base your, 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 your military development of the military capability of a country like Burkina Faso on voluntary contribution. It is not sustainable because the people can wake up tomorrow and they say they are not giving a game. So if they say they are not giving a game, where do you want to, um, uh, well, what becomes of the security governance in the country? Um, do you see maybe that for now um, the Burkina population enjoy uh, being part of this initiative simply because it gives them a sense of uh, belonging, a sense of authority and that power as it relates to security? So I'm saying what qualifies a man to demand accountability from his government, a citizen to demand accountability from his or her government, Firstly, it is because of the because of the right conferred on that person to be the citizen of that country. So the secondary thing is the issue of uh, patriotism, and then the issues of um, uh, whether you pay tax. Then it gives somebody an incentive to demand accountability from the government. So I'm saying this to underscore the fact that. Whether they do voluntary contribution or they don't do voluntary contribution, they, they, the constitutional right in, uh, conferred on the citizens, the Burkina Bay, empowers them to actually demand for, a secure, for accountability in the securities funding of the country, in the security governance of the country. So this is just an added advantage, but it, it's not the ultimate. As long as they are citizens of those countries, they have the patriotic duty to their country, including the payment of tax including voting and election in an election that is sufficient as a framework to demand for accountability in the first place so whether they contribute voluntarily or not they have to play that constitutional role and then now that they are doing that i think the accountability framework is to now determine how they are spending this specific money in fact they should exercise some form of ownership control over that money in terms of uh, maybe the, the the governance framework that administer the money, the board, and the system that ensure that the money is spent judiciously for the reason why it is contributed in the first place. So I think it's in order that they have that accountability overview over over the spending of the money. That was Dr. Wale Ojowale, a senior researcher with the Institute for Security Studies, ISS Dakar, Senegal. Nigeria, a country of 200 million plus people, is battling a myriad of security challenges, including terrorism, banditry, kidnapping, and intercommunal conflict, among others. These realities present even tougher situations, such as overstretched manpower and complaints about budget constraints from security agencies. But for some states like Lagos, the nation's commercial center and home, to multi-billion dollar investments like the Dangote Refinery has established what is called the State Security Trust Fund. From all indications, this initiative, like the PSF in Burkina Faso, is very well alive. A Nigerian security expert and data analyst, Dr. Steve Okori, explains. Lagos has a security trust fund. The security trust fund now is individuals, wealthy individuals, at Lagos, where they make contributions to that trust fund where the state government now use to see how to fight insecurity. But you see, even before now, we have seen situations where people from different communities try to put uh, uh, monies together to see how to support the police. I think I'll give you an instance here. My, there's a community, there's a, my community where I come from that we live in Abuja. There are times that we support the police. There was a time that we had to put uh, monies together to see how to lighten uh, the police environment. Because usually when you approach the police, you see that the whole uh, the whole surrounding is dark when there's no light and all that. So we had to come up with uh, solar power panels. And we also made that effort to see how to buy some communication gadgets, you know, like walkie-talkies, to see how to support the police in our, in our local government uh, area. So, please, let me yeah. come in here. You mentioned the Lagos State Security Fund. At least, even from outside Nigeria, Lagos is very popular. It's the commercial hub of Nigeria, where you have almost all the richest people in Nigeria 
um, offices or their businesses headquartered. Yeah. So it's more like invest in security to protect their investments. Uh, do you have other states in Nigeria Absolutely. that have piloted this same um, trust fund just so that they boost their security presence and protect the population? You see, every governor has one or two initiatives when they come to power. So I expect that governors of other states will see how security are being tackled in other states. I don't have the information of other states that have a security trust fund where the other indigenous or non-indigenous, but all of them are resident in that state, make these donations. Like, I will still go back to Lagos. I tell me your title now, if a, a, a businessman that is very prominent and all that. At some point, I saw that he donated some millions of naira into that trust fund, and other people are also donating. So other states, I expect that they should also borrow a leave from Lagos so that they can have a pulse where monies from individuals that are wealthy or not, but who have one naira or two naira to contribute to that trust fund. Now, fighting insecurity has gone beyond what the government alone can handle. You know, it, it, it's something that if all hands must be on deck. Every little contributions that each and every Nigerian or non-Nigerian wants, but provided they are resident in Nigeria, want to contribute to it, there is need for people to see how to contribute to it. We have companies here, you know, the, the corporate social responsibilities. How are they doing it? You know, how are they coming in? How are they supporting the government? You know, we have businesses here, companies here, factories here. What are their contributions to the fight against insecurity? So funds like that can come from all these uh, organizations or companies that I've mentioned so that they can still have to support the government in the fight against insecurity. If given the go-ahead, you'd actually recommend or suggest that from the local level, from the grassroots level to the state and regional level, mm. that there are initiatives mm. like this to support security agencies in carrying out their tasks because according to you, security is everybody's business. There's, there's nothing wrong because you know you know security security does a lot. Without security, you don't expect any meaningful development. Without security, you don't expect uh, farmers to go go to their farms. Of course, there'll be food insecurity and all that. A whole lot comes with when there's no security in the land. So for businesses to to, to strive, we must have to be seen that there's enough security, there's an enabling environment for all this to happen. You know, so whichever way that the government feels that it's the way to go. And individuals or group of people or group of indi or organizations, companies, and we see that there's need for them to make certain contributions in the fight against insecurity in Nigeria. I think it's the way to go. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's not still go back to Lagos because that is like the most established, uh, it's like one of the most established facts that you have the Lagos State Security Trust Fund. And I think one of the states in the, uh, in the southwest, they have Amotekun, which also belongs to the state. Now, supposing yes. uh, local funding will be strengthened and supported and will gain that popular uh, support, what do you think yes. should be considered at the end of the day? You mentioned the Amotekun in the southwest. If you follow the trend of events in the southwest, you will see that Amotekun, they are doing very well in the area of fighting insecurity with the collaboration uh, with uh, collaboration with the Nigerian police and other security agencies you know members of the Amotek are members from these very communities where they are serving an Amotek member in Ondo state will not go and serve in Ogun state because of course you agree with that he is not familiar with the terrain and the environment where if they take him to Ogun state so Amotek members are within their own very the very immediate community of the Congo. And I expect the other region or geopolitical zones in Nigeria. We have the north central geopolitical zone, we have the north northwest, northeast and the south south and all that. I expect that they should borrow a leaf from this uh, southwest geopolitical zone to establish their own local security. Now, in monitoring these funds, in the event where these funds are given to these local structures that we are talking about. There is need for a monitoring team between the organizations that have given out these funds. They will ensure that this money got to these local structures like Amotec for the purpose and this, this, this team should ensure that for the purpose of transparency and accountability, the monies that is given to this local organization should be seen that the money is used judiciously for the purpose. We talk about uh, patrol vehicles, Dr. Steve Okori is a security expert and data analyst. 
In rounding up, the United Nations Secretary General Antony Guterres has urged commitment to creating a world where everyone can live free from fear, stigma and persecution. He remarked on Thursday, August 22, the International Day of Victims of Acts of Violence Based on Religion or Belief. Here is Stefan Dujaric, spokesperson for the UN Secretary General. In a message for the day, the Secretary General said around the world, individual communities faced violence based on religion or belief, stressing that we must urgently combat this scourge. The Secretary General urges all to reaffirm our commitment to creating a world where everyone can live free from fear, from stigma and persecution, calling on governments to protect all people and places of worship, implement comprehensive and anti-discrimination laws, and invest in education initiatives that foster inclusion and equal rights. Stefan Dujaric, spokesperson for the UN Secretary General. And this is how we end this week's episode of In the Sahel, WADR's security program aiming to tell the African security crisis the African way. Thank you for listening. And many thanks to my guests and colleagues for their contributions. Join us frequency 94.9 FM, West Africa Democracy Radio, every Friday at 7.30 a.m. and the same day at 6.30 p.m. for the rebroadcast. You can also log on to www.wadr.org for these and previous editions of the program or simply visit WADR on SoundCloud and AudioMac. I'm Abdullah Hassan. Until next week, it's bye for now.